You are now about to witness the strength of the Hip Hop for Justice radio podcast, where art meets activism. The December 2nd shooting of Mario Woods by five officers. The 2014 death of Michael Brown. The 32-year-old Philando Castile. We can, we must win in the name of justice. In the name of justice for Mario Woods. In the name of justice for all others who've been brutalized by police. By police. People who are ready and willing to fight for justice. Hip-hop artists are our leaders today. More than just a rapper, you are a teacher, you are an artist, and you are a leader. Your voices, your words, your rhythms have attracted young people in all of the countries of the earth that allow your music and your lyrics to be played. Peace. Welcome to the Hip Hop for Justice radio podcast. I am Brother Miles, alongside my partners, S1W James Baum of the legendary Public Enemy, and the queen of hip-hop for justice, my sister Half Pint, of the legendary Son of Berserk featuring No Self-Control. Tonight we're doing the math with Dr. Wesley Muhammad. We're going to get into the weaponization of hip-hop. We're going to get into the military entertainment complex. We're going to get into the fear frequency. We're going to get into the drug proliferation and the glorification of drug use within hip hop. We're gonna get into the value of the hip hop community and the need for a cultural revolution. Before we get into that, let's get into our segments. We're gonna hear from Half Pint to give us a peace of mind. Peace, peace, peace of mind. Peace my brothers and sisters. This is part six of my segment, The Miseducation of Black Children. African people face several critical challenges in the educational system today. According to Asa G. Hilly III, there's a belief problem. Many people who serve our children do not believe they have the capability to do what is necessary or required in schools. There's a problem of will and of ignorance. Few people are aware of public and private schools that are able to turn children's lives around and produce the highest levels of academic achievement and socialization. The ignorance of these models cause us to set our sights too low and demand too little to our, of our professionals. The cultural ignorance is when professionals do not understand the African culture. There's a problem with accountability, and also there's a problem with the African community. Too many of us are asleep, dependent, unorganized, and not assuming our responsibilities. We rely almost totally on a school structure, and sometimes teachers who are alien to the communities that they serve to socialize our children. And there's a problem with equity. Formal research in our anecdotal experiences during the Brown years has allowed Asa G. Hilliard to make some generalizations. One, when children don't learn, systems are deficient. Two, the race of a child does not tell us anything about the child's mentality or their capacity to succeed in school. Three, social economic status is not a barrier to learning if the student is exposed to good teaching. Four, racism and bigotry are negative factors in teaching and learning. Five, our children are not succeeding mainly because the masses of them have been abandoned. And six, the courts can mandate physical desegregation, but not an educational environment that is high quality and nurturing. How much do they care about the Africans, Latinos, and Native Americans, and other children in the depths of poverty? The education and general welfare of the masses of our children is not a high public policy priority. Building prisons is one of the nation's, nation's highest priorities. Great sums of money are being allocated for the real priorities, while educational reform, primarily a rhetorical priority, with unfocused goals and no money. This begins the pipeline to prison in the new Jim Crow. Most African children do not have access to quality education. To remedy the situation, we need a new conversation, a series of summits to conceptualize, to devise strategies, and to take action. These conferences have been taking place all around the country with black educators, but unless we can legislate this situation so that we can make sure that we have equity, we will continue to have these issues. We are a society of many cultures. Our challenge and our responsibility, if we are to survive, is to show the world what cultural democracy means in the 21st century. The failure to acknowledge and to respect other cultures is the base 
of the newest forms of inequity. 50 years after Brown should be enough time for people of goodwill to see a massive new focus and efforts that are needed to resolve and take the next difficult steps. Peace, my brothers and sisters. And now let's hear from S1W James Bomb with the Louder Than a Bomb segment. Peace, family. This segment tonight, we're really going to dig back into what's going on with our brother Colin Kaepernick. And since that time, almost three years ago, we've seen other stars like Rihanna recently declined the Super Bowl appearance, which is one of the largest stages in the world in terms of exposure. But she declined it. And from her decline, we see the 49ers cheerleader just recently kneeled down. So my point is that we are all chiming in on our brother and him protesting silently didn't hurt anybody, but the NFL wanted to give him a hard time on him protesting. I have a young man who I grew up with his uncle and aunts. The world know him as Anquan Bolden, who once played for the 49ers. He just jumped in recently with a young man from Philadelphia who's also a professional football player, and they raising money on police brutality and protesting. So right now the NFL is in trouble. 70% of the league is black people, and they're getting ready to do the Super Bowl in Atlanta, which is the black mecca, and they got white groups on, but no black groups. The game will be played in Atlanta, the biggest, blackest city in America, the driving force behind most pop music and home of legends, and such as Outkash, Usher, Ludacris, T.I., and currently a supergroup, Migos, and Native Son, Lil John. His classic alone is 800 million YouTube viewers. But many black fans were angered in September when the halftime headliner for the game in Black Mecca was revealed as Maroon 5, a white pop group from Los Angeles. So you have Jay-Z, who turned it down last season, and even a comedian, Amy Schumer, who turned it down as well. So Colin Kaepernick is right on point, and we support you, my brother. Thank you for listening. Peace. And there it is. All right, family, it's about that time. We're going to dive into this conversation with Dr. Wesley Muhammad, known researcher and scholar and student minister of the Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan in the Nation of Islam. Dr. Wesley, welcome to the Hip Hop for Justice radio podcast. Assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum salam, brother Miles. How are you? Man, by Allah's grace, well, thank you for, for taking time from your Sunday evening and other things that you uh-huh. could be doing to be with us tonight. Yes, to, to you and Brother James and Sister Half Punk, it absolutely is my honor to share these these uh, radio waves with you and I'm honored that you would allow me a moment with your with your the audience on your platform. Well the honor is ours, beloved, and in you know, as as I said, you've I've watched interviews, I've watched uh the footage when um, in Detroit with the artists that you yes, um, sat and, and spoke with, um, and yes, there was a lot that you said in your interview with Todd One in, in, in the conversation with the artists in Detroit. And some of what I just mentioned were just little bullet points that I think, and of course, everybody knows about the Breakfast Club uh, discussion and, and interview. So let's just jump right in. Let's jump right yes, into, you know, hip hop, um, the the weaponizing or the weaponization of, of hip hop, and 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 some of these things that you you've said, you know, people naturally when you when you use language like that, people kind of look at you, and, you know, side eye you or raise an right. eyebrow, you know. Right. But let's get into what you you mean. Let's go in depth. You know, with these statements, and let's let's uh, let's dive right on in. So, you said yes, hip hop. You said rappers are the gods of the black community. Let let's go there first. Let's start right there. What do you mean when you say rappers are the gods of the black community? 
Yes, sir. Thank you. Um, first, let me preface that with the enemy has not weaponized hip-hop because hip-hop is bad. The enemy has weaponized hip-hop because he recognizes that hip-hop is divine. Mm. It's the divinity of hip-hop that inspired our enemy to commandeer it and to redirect it and to use it to further his agenda rather than letting it organically and naturally serve the agenda of God himself. Um, So the weaponization of hip hop is due to what uh, the wicked scientists of this world know clearly about hip hop. And so I, I, I have been saying, and I say tonight, um, it is my opinion that the rappers are, and specifically the hot rappers, the hot, I'm not making an aesthetic judgment. I simply mean whoever the hot rappers are mm-hmm. um, at any given time. Right, right. They are the gods of the black community. And I believe, Brother Miles, that at this point, we can actually scientifically demonstrate that that's not hyperbole or black Muslim rhetoric. I believe we are in a position to scientifically demonstrate that because a God is a being of power and force. Whether that is a good God or a bad God, that's not necessarily uh, implied by the statement God. That's a being of power and force. And it can be demonstrated that no group of people, no specific democracy has the power and influence as this particular group of people, this particular circle of demography or demographic group, the hip hop artists, no group has the level of power and influence that they have not only for the miles to set trends in America or globally, not just to get us to switch up what shoes we like this week or what pants or what belts we want to rock. Their power extends well beyond trend setting. The hot rappers in conjunction with the hot producer, that combination, a hot rapper and a hot producer has the scientific ability to determine the direction of black life in America and globally. So that's the reason I say the rappers are the gods of the black community. Now when you talk about you you in Detroit you talked about power. You talked about atonement. Yes sir. Why why atonement? What do you mean by you know, when when you hear that term, you 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 don't hear it applied in a conversation with hip hop. So yes, sir. why why well, would you mention atonement when talking yes, with and to the artist? Yes, sir. Not only because that particular meeting happened during our the Nation of Islam's annual celebration of our holy day of atonement. Um, But because, one, all black America, every one of us, needs to atone. Every single black person needs to die, sackcloth and ashes, come out of our house and atone for our contribution by omission or commission. Our contribution to the state of black America. The hip hop artists in particular, the hip hop community, the cultural community in general, and the hip hop artists in particular, as the drum majors of the cultural community, 
They are, they too have much to atone for, as all of us do. Um, Hip hop was hijacked. So there's a sense in which, in the beginning of this weaponizing process, that we can really place in the late 80s. Mm -hmm. Um, At the beginning of this process, we didn't see it coming. And so I would say that there's some innocence that based on naivete that was involved but in 2018 we've been seeing the artistic community have been seeing what's going on with the community and the effect that it's having on our people and so we have become complicit in the process and so on that strength alone the hip hop community who has bought into the uh, the only reason in 2018 so-called gangster rap under different monikers today you know people get mad because they're in denial when I mention Wu-Tang Clan for example as gangster rap because people want to pigeonhole gangster rap to um, Dr. Dre and Tupac and Death Row they think the gangster rap is only a West Coast phenomenon. But there's an East Coast gangster rap. Yeah, it has a different flavor, but it's still gangster rap. Sex, drugs, and money. There's Southern gangster rap. And in 2018, we don't call it gangster rap. We call it trap. Um, even mumble rap. We got all of these different names for it but the whole industry there's one paradigm of commercial rap now we the the only reason that one paradigm of commercial rap and I'm distinguishing commercial rap because I understand that there's artists who are doing who's trying to um, push righteous rap commercial rap that we that most of us consume on a daily basis The only reason that program could be still in place and successful today in 2018 is because the artistic community has capitulated to the paradigm. And so we know, for example, I'll give you the best example in closing. I could use Future, but but I I would use um, 50 Cent. 50 Cent said something very interesting. 50 Cent never um, drank or smoke or use any drugs in life. You don't smoke weed. Yet, he makes music about smoking weed. And he said that the reason he did, he made these songs about using drugs when he never in life used drugs, is because he saw people moving 500,000 units <laughs> rapping about that. So he said he's going to make some music about that. So that's the level of complicity. That's an isolated example, but I believe we can justifiably extrapolate there are thousands of examples of those over these last 20, 30 years or so. Yeah, that's complicity that the community needs among other things, what the rest of us needs to atone for. Absolutely. Absolutely. Now, in this, in that discussion with the artists in Detroit, um, and I'm going to ask you to to repeat. Now, I'm sure some on this call have not seen this interview. Um, but even if they did, it, it bears repeating because you went deep. You talked about how weed was the, the drug of choice within hip hop. Yeah. And it yeah. was, and I'm here in the Bay. So naturally, I want to hear yes. you go yeah. deep into that because I lived that and I saw it yes, sir. although in the nation you know I still saw it um, yes sir and I'm you sure. know so you talked about weed being the drug of choice at, at one time and here we are now post the chronic it's mm-hmm. Molly it's right. the glorification of pill popping and right. if you can go into how gangster rap began who pushed and promoted gangster rap how it became so popular 
among us, those behind it, as well as the um, I can't remember the, the 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 term used. Was it the grandfather of Mali or or the the grand? Yes. Yeah, the, yeah. the Godfather of Exodus. The Godfather uh, Alexander of Exodus. Schultz. Yes, yeah, sir. I think yes, we sir. need to hear that. So if, if you could go into that detail as you did in Detroit, I think it would be very beneficial for those listening. Yes, I would be happy to. Um, though, unfortunately, I can't have that discussion and not include a discussion, which I didn't include there in Detroit, but I did in Atlanta, being that... Um, you're in the bay I'm going to have to discuss Matt Drake Absolutely, um, and, Absolutely. And, and this narrative Because he's key Absolutely. May Allah be pleased with our brother Matt Drake So you mentioned um, a, a couple of things the, We being the drug of choice How we became the drug of choice of, of hip hop um, To the origin of gangsta rap and then three um the situation with molly um yes, and and hip-hop um and and i agree i use the molly situation i believe that it is a perfect um illustration of the larger phenomena and it's very insidious i believe the molly how I think it was um, one one of the hip hop periodicals. Um, I should have it right here. There, headline. Yeah, here it is. Um, the head rap rap rehab. The headline was Molly overtakes weed in rap music culture. Mm. The this phenomenon, not just of weed and hip hop. But we being overtaken by Molly ecstasy, a pharmaceutical. Black mm-hmm. folks didn't do pharmaceuticals. Um, the fact that it that this particular pharmaceutical, lab made, what overtook weed and hip hop, the story behind that is very insidious and is very illustrative of how and why hip hop was weaponized so first the weed thing yes dear family I know California loves this green leaf but um, and that's fine that's fine I, I don't take a position on that if you listen to your brother clearly that's not what I do I don't moralize on you or, or anyone else not you to generic you Right. You know, what you want to do recreationally, but we are providing the the reason we smoke the weed that we smoke and the effects that it has on us, which are the desired effects of those who are really behind us smoking this weed the way we do. So marijuana has been weaponized, even in, in California. The marijuana wedge, to be real clear, the cannabis that God planted has a natural THC content of less than one percent. The marijuana that you guys in the Bay Area and in Southern California and in Colorado and in Chicago, um, that we has THC content 14, 15, 20 percent. That double that's a double weed. Mm-hmm. Our lessons tell us that double is anything grafted from a rich dog. Right. And the only way um, you can get cannabis with a THC content, with an increased THC content and diminished C B D content, it's a grafted. First it was grafted in a laboratory, but then breeders um started grafting it in backyards but whether it's grafted in the laboratory or grafted in your backyard it's still a grafted plant it's a double plant and the double will always do what a double do the double does not do good the double's effect even when 
he does something that looks good on the surface, just wait long enough, you will see the evil effects of what he or it does. So that's the situation with cannabis. And what's important to note regarding hip hop, the relationship did not begin with hip hop and we first the initial um, hip hop artists or at, at that time rap artists were anti drug the original hip hop or rap message coming out of South Bronx was anti violence and anti drugs those right. early rap songs um, had for the most part an anti drug message even anti-weed message. When we became a part of hip hop, it really was the blunt, and this is very important, it wasn't just the joint that became uh, the symbol of hip hop. It was the blunt. And why that's so critical is because the blunt is very different from just a joint. The joint is cannabis plant rolled in a a in cigarette wrapping, so you just smoking the cannabis. The blunt is cannabis plant. It's weed rolled in a cigar shell that had tobacco in it, and we discussed and documented how tobacco is an ethnic weapon. Tobacco, the nicotine and tobacco binds to melanin, and therefore. Mm. Tobacco is more toxic to black people than to white people. This is why black people have a much harder time getting off of cigarettes than white people do because tobacco has a melanin affinity. Tobacco is effectively an ethnic weapon. And so the blunt that became the symbol of hip hop, not the joint, the blunt is the weaponized weed with the ethnic weapon tobacco in the cigar shed. So that's not an accident. So we had this relationship that developed secondarily between hip hop and the blunt. And the blunt rose, incidentally, the blunt and hip hop rose around the same time that malt liquor and hip hop rose. And this is very important because malt liquor isn't just beer. White folks drink cores, but black folks were drinking 40 ounces. The difference between malt liquor, which was marketed exclusively to black people, and through hip hop, malt liquor has a alcohol content three times the content of what Coors or Miller has that white folks drink. So malt liquor is a cheap liquor with an excessively high alcohol content that was marketed specifically to black people through hip hop. And they really started marketing the blunt and hip hop after the LA riots. Now, alcohol, we discussed alcohol estrogenizes the body. It re not only reduces male testosterone, but it increases estrogen in the male body. So malt liquor and the blunt were both um, symbols of hip hop that were imposed on hip hop from the outside now you asked about who is behind this mm -hmm. black people of course were the artists the so called gangster rappers no question but we would not have Ice-T's initial so-called gangster album if not for Cy Moore Sting and Sire Records a Jew we would not have N.W.A. and their Niggas for Life or Straight Outta Compton or Boys in the Hood we, we would not have the so-called Godfathers or grandfathers of gangster rap, which they actually are not, but in popular parlance, the so called Godfathers of gangster rap, if not for Jerry Heller and Brian Turner, both of them Jews. They are the reason we can enjoy the album because they are the ones who put the album, willing to put the album in the streets. 
see more sign is through Sire Records. It's the reason Ice T's album was able to be enjoyed on the streets. We would not have any death row artists except for Edgar Brossman, Doug Morris, and Jimmy O'Brien are you. They are the reason we can enjoy Tupac. They are the reason we can enjoy Chronic. And like I said in top one, I'm partial. I love, you know, as, as a music consumer, mm -hmm. I love the Chronic. Yeah. Music, I love it. I, I, I'm, I'm guilty. But the fact remains that, I, and I love pop. Right. But the fact remains is we would have none of that if not for Edgar Brockman, Doug Morris, and Jimmy O'Brien. Jews. We would not have the Ghetto Boys without Brian Turner and Rick Rubin. We would not have Wu-Tang Clan, Mob Chief, Alcoholics without Steve Rifkind and I, uh, Rich Isaacson of Loud Records. All of the gangster rappers, all of the early gangster production was packaged and given to us by a specific tiny circle of people. A group of Jews who in America have mastered packaging a particular form of blackness that larger white America enjoys consuming. And so this is why we have gangster rap because it was packaged and delivered to us by a particular set of people, Jews, this small tiny group of people who have have had an inimical relationship with black people since our first encounter during slavery. Now, this Miley thing, and I, I don't mean to belabor any points no, if no, you no, want to get time. in. No, no, um, this, this Miley thing, first, the same one who what who's was ultimately responsible for the successful weaponization of marijuana is the exact same one who's responsible for the molly that our rappers are rapping about popping. And so when Rap Rehab says in his headline, Molly overtakes weed in music culture, in two of those references, the name Alexander Shujin should come to mind. In the reference to Molly, Alexander Shujin should come to mind. And in the reference to we, Alexander Shujin should come to mind. Why is that? Am I saying that this Russian Jew who did his work for the U.S. government there in the Bay? Uh, he had a personal lab in his home there in the Bay where he had one of the rare licenses given by the U.S. government not only to reproduce any Schedule One drug. Any drug that's Schedule One means it's completely outlawed. And anybody caught with it uh, is charged with felony possession or distribution. He had a rare license to, in his backyard there in the Bay Area to produce any Schedule 1 drugs. And one of the reasons for the mouth is because many of the Schedule 1 drugs, he created them himself in his Bay Area backyard. But what's important about Alexander Shujin is one difference between the weed that you know, Louis Armstrong and the boys, the jazz artists of the 40s and 50s, right? The difference between the weed that they smoke and the weed that is smoked today, there, not only was the THC content lower then, but their weed wasn't addictive. Mm. This weed is addictive, and nobody who smokes loud or grow any of that can cry. They're not addicted. This weed is addictive. Is addictive. But it was made addictive scientifically by a specific 
scientific move and that move incidentally the author of that move is Alexander Shulton the reason the way you make weed addictive when it's not naturally addictive cannabis isn't naturally addictive because most narcotics these drugs that are addictive their addictive quality among other qualities comes from the fact that they are alkaloid that means they have a nitrogen atom in their constitution that contributes to among other things their addictiveness cannabis is one of the rare plants that affect the central nervous system that's not an alkaloid it doesn't have a nitrogen atom so it's not a narcotic even though it's scheduled as schedule one drug narcotic and and I'm going to get to why naturally cannabis is not a narcotic because it lacks the nitrogen atom it's not an alkaloid however it became an alkaloid it was Alexander's children that told the government how to make THC addictive by introducing a nitrogen atom into the THC molecule and by doing that they made THC similar in structure and effect to morphine the narcotic so this is why the weed that's being smoked today is so addictive because it is it has been scientifically made a narcotic which is why they can justify making marijuana a schedule one narcotic and all of these pro legalizationers argue and they're not wrong they just don't they're just naive argue that cannabis should not be a schedule one drug because it's a natural plan and it's a, it's not a narcotic well yeah God's cannabis that's right that applies to guys such cannabis it don't apply to what's being smoked because what's being smoked today is the weed that has it's THC if you examine the THC not only the content is increased but the THC molecule itself I guarantee you you will find a nitrogen atom in it because the streets were flooded with this new alkaloid cannabis that never exists naturally so and there was Alexander Shulton who gave the government the formula to make THC alkaloid mm. and this is what was this is what is in the blunt that hip hop artists were smoking he's the exact same one who resynthesized what's called then MDMA we call it Molly right and now with the Bay Area I'm gonna I'm I'm land this plane here <laughs> and bring it home to the All Bay right. yes sir because Alexander Shulton uh, his laboratory was there in the Bay Area and he synthesized resynthesized he didn't create MDMA the Germans did but he discovered why he's called the grandfather of, of the godfather of ecstasy is because he originated a new way to synthesize MDMA. The Germans produced it through one means, but he innovated a new way to synthesize MDMA. And it's his resynthesized MDMA that is at the root of the ecstasy and then Molly street drug phenomenon but before it was Molly before it was ecstasy it was Adam he created that drug brother that pharmaceutical brother Miles with the intent of unlocking uh, the dark sexuality of the user say that again Mm. his intent with producing many of his pharmaceuticals but specifically with 
MDMA. His intent was to have the drug unlock dark sexualities or sexualities in this user. And so it does that. How does Molly do that? Molly does a number of things. Not only does it diminish serotonin, serotonin is a brain chemical that's required to put brakes on our natural appetites and instincts such as our sexuality. When our serotonin levels are healthy, then we can have rational and reasonable control over all of our urges. They don't burst forth. But if you deplete brain serotonin, then you give your natural animalistic appetites free reign. And so over-sexuality and homosexuality can burst forth. And that's aided by the fact that MDMA not only depletes ser- brain serotonin, but it floods the brain with oxytocin, and the so-called hug drug. And this combination inclines the user to hypersexuality and even homosexuality. And that's why it was called, before it was called ecstasy, it was released there and they tried to start the social experiment with Adam. The original name, street name that they gave it was Adam, A-D-A-M. And the reason they gave it A-D-A-M, Adam, because children was a Jew. He gave it to his man there in Oakland, psychiatrist Leo Zeff, also a Jew, to promote it. Why is that important? Because in Jewish rabbinic tradition, Adam had specific significance. Adam was a hermaphrodite. Adam was in rabbinic Jewish tradition. He was an androgen. He was he was a he had both male and female characteristics. And so MDMA before it was ecstasy, before it was Molly, they named it Adam after Adam the hermaphrodite of Jewish tradition because they intended the drug to hermaphrodite the user. So the male user, his female side will be given strength. And so he will no longer be a man, Adam the man, he'll be Adam the hermaphrodite. It androgenizes the user. This is what their intent was. And they first introduced this social experiment with the drug. They first tried to introduce it there in the Bay Area. Leo Zeff. They brought in CIA drug pusher Timothy Leary of LSD fame and had him try to propagate Adam there in the Bay Area. They set up in Moraine County. They set up a manufacturing uh, center for Adam, but it didn't go with it. This is in the 70s. It didn't go anywhere then, so they transferred the social experiment to Chicago and Texas. But now let's fast forward. Mm. They didn't leave. They weren't done with the bet. Right. They were able to popular rock, reintroduce MDMA uh, through the nation of Islam. And all of you in the Bay, you know what the nation of Islam is. Matt Dre and his thistles. Diz Entertainment. Diz, of course, was Matt Dre's name for ecstasy or for Molly when he got out of jail after doing that that bid for not turning on on his partners um, on the, that bank robbery situation he went in you know his rocker room crew they were straight um, you know hardcore thugs and that's what rocker room music that they produced that's what it was about when Mac Dre came out he was still doing Rumpa Room however in 90s 
six, he sat down with City Hall Records. And City Hall Records run by two Jews, Robin Kahn and Walter Zelda. Two Jews, Bay Area Jews. Leo Zeff, a Bay Area Jew. Um, Alexander Sugin, a Bay Area Jew. It was when Matt Dre sat down with City Hall Records and these two Bay Area Jews, he changed the label from Rockwell Room to Diz Entertainment. Diz, a reference to Molly. And his whole rap stilo changed. And all of his so, so he's popping pills now. He's popularizing. This entertainment is popularizing. Money. And it's catching heat there in the Bay Area. And even because uh, Tech Nine, who was doing himself, was popping pills. He, before Max Ray, he said, he said when he was one of the long black people popping pills before Max Ray. When Max Dre came out with his fizzles and everything is this, that's when black people in the Bay started doing Molly. Now, the come full circle. This entertainment, they are not just promoting Alexander Sugin's MDMA. Alexander Shulgin, Leo Zeff, they're not just promoting Molly among black people in the Bay Area. The federal government got his entertainment on nationwide Molly distribution. And about 24 um, individuals associated with this nation or this entertainment um, were indicted on nationwide uh, drug distribution charges and one of the main drugs that distributed is MDMA but the awful footnote and I trace this specifically to the Jewish handlers of my brother I don't attribute this to my brother Mac Dre Mac Dre while he's doing the diz- dizzle dance right while he's promoting hyphy you know, what they say is androgenizing style of music. He went from gangster music with Rumpa Room to androgenizing music with Heisey. Remember, Adam is the, the androgynous being the hermaphrodite, the two sets being. So he went from gangster music with Rumpa Room to androgynous music Heisey while he's promoting uh, the use of this androgenizing drug MDMA among black people in the Bay Area and it's catching heat and he had an alter ego Muhammad al Bubu. Mm-hmm. Muhammad al Bubu, who was over what he called the nation of Islam now remember in LA after the riots the LA riots, the Nation of Islam played a key role in the uniting of the Crips and the Bloods, the beginning. Right. And that 19, the 1992 riots and the aftermath of it determined so much in terms of subsequent governmental policy. And one of the outcomes of that, the fact that the Nation of Islam was already hated but was so central to the unifying of the gangs there they played such a key role the governmental targeting of the nation was turned up and so here we have the nation of Islam and he as Muhammad al-Bubu has a book of scripture for his Islam, not nation of Islam, nation of Islam. So there's a mock making of the nation of Islam through a, a specific means of 
promotion of this drug that androgenizes black people, makes black people two sex or no sex at all. So this was um, done. And my last point, Bone. Bone had a song um, on ecstasy, one of the early songs that were dedicated strictly to ecstasy. Busy Bone had a verse on the song, but he reported and vibed it. He wanted his verse to come off because he doesn't use ecstasy. But he was told to write a song or write some bars for it. So he did, promoting it, but after he said he wanted his uh, verses to be taken off because he doesn't use it he doesn't want to be associated with it and the reason he didn't want to be associated with it he said is because he see these men dropping down giving other men all sex when they on mdma he said i don't want to have nothing to do with that the weaponization of hip-hop hmm. and the secret relationship between a white jew and a black homosexual molly is critical in that Wow, you, you 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 said a lot, and I want to. It leads really right into hip hop being used for behavior modification. Can you yes, expound sir. on that, based Absolutely. on where we are and what we're seeing in present time? Absolutely. Now I said <clears throat> the hot rapper and the hot producer. Together, that's God by you right there. That is the most potent combination for behavioral control. And it's not me. We have um, best scientists stating that behavioral control through music is more effective and easier than behavior control through any other means, including drugs. Why? Why is music so effective um, in terms of behavior control? Because our behaviors derive from our thoughts, our brain. And the brain can be effectively manipulated through music. Music can entrain, our brains can entrain and does entrain, E-N-T-R-A-I-N, entrain to music. That means if you were to witness an EEG, you know, a brain scan, that captures the firing of neurons in the brain, you would see if music is played, you will see the firing rhythms, the rhythms of the firing of our neurons, you will see those rhythms synchronized to the rhythm of the music that's being played. That's called entrainment. Mm -hmm. And that's done easily, it's done all the time, it's done naturally because the human organism mm -hmm. is a vibrational organism. Right. Our very bodies are somebody one philosopher said the human body is the the heart of a thousand strings. That's his body. It, it, it's a heart in the sense that with a thousand strings, it's an organ, it's a vibrational organism that can be played like a heart. Because of the vibrational nature of our organism, we can be played like a musical instrument. If somebody such as God or a wicked scientist knows how to play the instrument of the human organism, you can get the human organism to do whatever you desire it to do. Mm. And they have learned it through music by entraining the brain, synchronizing brain frequencies with particular music. They can get any group of people to engage in what they call herd behavior. Now, let me say this because I, I can already hear some 
thought stuff did. <laughs> well, I, I, I've been at a concert and, you know, I've never had the inclination to do anything. Uh, the science of her behavior, these devils said this. The music only has to affect 2% of the pop desired population. That's all. If the music is effective on just 2% of the target population, that's enough such that eventually change is unavoidable. So by achieving just 2% effectiveness, eventually they can um, normalize whatever behavior they want. All they have to do is be 2% effective of the target population. So if we're at a concert and say all of the the um, songs have been scientifically weaponized, which mean, by which I mean this, the music, first, the lyrics are of sec they're important, but they're of secondary scientific importance. Of primary importance is actually the music itself. Because the music is the first thing that will um, manipulate the organism, the biological organism, and especially the neurological organism. The music, depending on its frequency, it can push buttons in the brain. If the music, when it hits your, your two ears, for example, especially if we have on headphones. Yeah, we want to get we are listening that. to our, our, our music with headphones on, be our beach by Dre, then they then they got us. That's an easy kill, right? Because they can, uh, sub, they can create a phantom beat in our mind through headphones, through this process called binaural beats, by sending one frequency, say <clears throat> a frequency of, of three hundred and twenty, and one or say two hundred and forty, a frequency two hundred and forty hurts in my right ear and a frequency of 244 hertz in my left ear the difference between those two is four hertz the brain will hear a four hertz beat and the whole brain will synchronize to a four hertz beat now why that's so critical is because four hertz is the fear frequency. Four hertz is a mathematical frequency formula to create fear and, and anxiety in that organism. Mm. And you won't even know why all of a sudden, all of a sudden you're, you're overcome with depression, you're overcome with fear. It can be created without our knowledge in our brains by creating these phantom beats through the process of our neural beats. So say we're at a concert, but it doesn't have to come through um, headphones because in fact, this was first tested, this science was first tested at concerts in London where the music selection was specifically laced with for frequency, they, 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 they use a different me method to lay the concert selection with a 4 hertz frequency. And 20%, they got a 20% effective rate. 20% of the audience reported inexplicably being overcome with fear, anxiety, and depression. 20%. But only 2% is necessary to eventually normalize her behavior. And so, I'm sorry, we, where do we start at? We, we're putting so much out there. Uh, we started with what question? So we were going into behavior modification. Behavior modification, that's right. So, so the first thing is the music. The music is what opens the mind up to the lyrics. The music is what opens, literally, scientifically, 
opens the mind up to the lyrics. Did you ever notice, like I did, much to my dismay, you know, you have the raunchy rap and you have the righteous rap. But inevitably, it's the worst music or the worst songs with the hottest beats. It's usually the worst songs with the best beats in the songs that we want to like because they're righteous. They just don't have the hot production. Right. Did you notice that or was that oh, just yeah. me? Nah, nah. It's, it's us. See, yeah, I know that. Yeah, see, that's by design because it's the beat that opens the brain up to suggestibility from the lyrics. So the beat is weaponized first. So if you have a particular beat and beats that synchronize to the black organism and very different from the beats that synchronize to the white organism, they're very different. Our organism is melodic. So this is why I mentioned on the Todd One interview, I love future. Don't, I, I let me say it different. I confess I enjoy Future's music. Mm -hmm. Even though he's the drum major of drug addiction, hip hop, and he don't even get it in like that. Mm -hmm. Man, I'm sure he smoked a little weed, but you can tell by his countenance. He's not the drug addict that he presents himself in his lyrics. You can tell by his skin. He don't get it in like, like he talks about it. Right, so he's a drum major of boss drug addiction rap, but his music is so melodic, it's so rhythmic, and I enjoy it, I confess. But therein lies the perfect formula, that's why he's so successful, because black people, the melodic, the rhythmic tunes is what more effectively entrain the black organism, the black mind and a black body. Rhythmic, melodic music is most effective in, the, in training to the black organism. And so when you have a properly prepared beat, it can send the frequency of the, that beat, the science of that music can sink us neurologically, our brain into a state they call theta state. A frequency state of the brain called theta state. Normally, we exist in our neurology, our, our, our neurons fire at a frequency that they, they describe as beta. A beta state is when we're awake, we're alert, um, we can make judgments and decisions in beta state. And it's alpha state and the money side is theta state. Theta state is when our our brain frequencies are below 7.9 hertz. If you can succeed in slowing our brain frequency down to below 7.9 hertz, but four hertz, five hertz. If you can synchronize our whole brain to a four or five hertz frequency, we're in theta state. And why that's so important? The, one of the significant characteristics of being in theta state, theta state is what you hear about shamans, you know about shamans and their drumming. Right. Um, they, at certain point after their drumming, they fall into an altered state of consciousness. And that altered state of consciousness that the, that the shaman falls into is theta state. Theta state, you're not asleep, but you're on the verge but what's characteristic of theta state is the left hemisphere is made inoperable. 
and the right hemisphere is operable. Why is that important? How this thing works. When information comes to us, when we're in beta state, when we're alert, information that comes to us is first filtered through our left hemisphere. Our critical apparatus is in our left hemisphere. So information that comes to us when we're in a normal state, beta state, we're conscious, we're alert, things that information or ideas that come to us that disagree with our general consciousness, we will reject it. It's the left hemisphere that alerts us to the fact that, all right, this piece of, of information is disagreeable. So it'll toss it out. So in beta state, for example, I list, I'm listening to um, Future, I, I Hate the Real Me, right? And his hook in I Hate the Real Me is, I want to get high as I can. I want to get high as I can. I want to get high as I can. See, they weaponize the hook. The hook is very important. His hook in this song, I want to get as high as I can. I want to get as high as I can. Now, when I'm conscious, I'm in my normal beta state. I can listen to that all day. And I won't have a single inclination to go out and get high. Because everything about my consciousness that's disagreeable to so that hook comes into my ear. My left hemisphere already vets it, lets me know it's disagreeable and rejects it. No problem. I can enjoy future and I'm not going out to get as high as I can. In beta state, the left hemisphere is deactivated and messages that would normally be found disagreeable by the left hemisphere, the critical apparatus of the left hemisphere, they get to slide right through because the critical apparatus is suspended. Just slide right through into the right hemisphere and find agreement. And so this is why, this is how you can normalize behavior such as homosexuality in a community that was perennially, the black community was known for being anti-homosexual they the media in the 80s and 90s in particular were real hard on the black community because we were anti-homosexual but you can part of the mechanism of transforming a community that was anti-homosexual to now a community that's one of the most pro homosexual communities you can do that through the music not just by putting it in lyrics but if those lyrics are riding the right beat the beat that especially when this is on headphones the song can sink us into data state by um do the process of binaural beats our brain can be put at four hertz or five hertz we're in theta state so whatever messages is riding that beat, it will enter our consciousness. It won't be rejected because the left hemisphere is deactivated. Our critical apparatus is deactivated. So whatever message is riding that beat, we can take it in and it can influence us, whether it's homosexuality, whether it's drug use, whether it's women being sluts and hoes, so we like to slut. We, we 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 promote the slut walk now. So our music promotes our men as being drug addict homosexuals and our women as being the world's Jezebels again and it's finding acceptance and what I'm suggesting or stating emphatically that the success of this process is not just because the lyrics are what they are, but it's specifically because these lyrics that promote this is writing deep that scientifically open our mind to accepting these ideas. Wow. Let's let's do this as as we begin to wind down. Let let's go into the this military entertainment 
complex. Yes. And if you could talk a little bit about what that is and what that means, because so many of us are familiar with military industrial complex, but I don't know how many have heard the term military entertainment complex. So if you could, you know, as as deep yet somewhat brief as you as you can, because we're going to go yes, into sir. we want to talk about because you're hitting so much from one perspective and it's necessary yes. so that we can then go to the next and talk about the God value of the hip hop yes, community sir. and the need for a cultural revolution. So we're, 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 we're creeping up on that, but let's go into this military entertainment complex. Yes, sir. So <clears throat> Sony Warner brothers, universal, for example, to start there. These are the big three um, record labels. All three of them have a working relationship with both the CIA and the U.S. military, be mm -hmm. it the U.S. Navy um, or the Army, uh, in any case, with the Pentagon, all three of them. And this relationship manifests itself for that and not just the the music portion but even the um the movie portion of these companies universal sony and ones both sides have working relationships with both the department of defense and the cia so with the pentagon and with language and that relationship manifests itself in many ways. One, for example, movies. The, the initial edit and the final edit of movies are influenced by this relationship with the Department of Defense and the CIA. Numerous examples of um, Hollywood uh, deferring to the Department of Defense in the production or the angling of a whole host of movies. The same thing with the music. The military entertainment complex also means this. Military technology. Technology that was created for military purposes is later re repurposed in the entertainment industry. And this is particularly germane in our discussion because the military's acoustic research, acoustic energy research, or its sonic weapons research, the U.S. military's research on how to weaponize sound and in particular music, that research was repurposed in the entertainment industry. That's what we're talking about. When we talk about the weaponization of hip hop, we're talking about military technology and military research that was deployed in a civilian, quote unquote, civilian context. In this um, context, we're talking about hip hop. So let's cite a very specific example. I said something on um, Instagram and, and people got a little excited in the not positive way. Um, oh, it's on a video clip. I mentioned the difference between rock and roll and hip hop, and the the, the scientific difference between black music and white music. And I use mm -hmm. um, rock and roll as an example of white music, and hip hop as an example of black music. And people are saying, no, 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 rock and roll is is. Is, is black music. Well, no, it's not. Uh, it is the case that rock and roll has its roots and the blues. That is absolutely the case. Little Richard was reported as, quoted as saying rock and roll is the illegitimate, is, is the blues illegitimate base. I, I accept that. That's a fact. But Bo Diddley and uh, Chuck Berry while the genre of rock and roll, and I'm really specifically talking about like heavy metal, but 
the rock and roll of the 60s, not Elvis Presley. So I'm not talking about Elvis Presley. I'm talking about the rock and roll icons of the 60s and 70s. Um, that is not, um, not only is that quintessential um, white music in that it is consonant with their nature, but what a lot of people don't know is that the rock and roll icons of the 60s and 70s, they are the sons and daughters of the military intelligence complex. The rock and roll icons of the 60s and 70s were the sons and daughters of the military intelligence complex. One of the key illustrations of this is Jim Morrison of the Duel. Jim Morrison was the leading, the lead singer of the rock group The Doors. Very popular in the 60s and 70s. An icon. What folks don't know is Jim Morrison is the son of U.S. Navy Admiral George Stephen Morrison. Who is George Stephen Morrison? George Stephen Morrison is the one who is critical in fabricating the infamous Gulf of Tonkin incident. The Gulf of Tonkin incident is a fabricated incident, a lie that led the U.S. into accelerating the Vietnam War. While the country, now this is important, the country was against America's involvement in the Vietnam War. There was a youth movement, white youth movement, anti-war movement. They called it the New, the, the new left, yeah, left. These are the sons and daughters of wealthy white people at Yale, at Berkeley. These are the sons and daughters of the white elite initiated an anti-war movement against the Vietnam War. The one who was key in fabricating the lies that justified us getting involved or accelerating our involvement in the Vietnam War, U.S. Navy Admiral George Morrison, his son, was positioning himself as lead singer of the Doors to take control of the youth counter-revolution. Because rock and roll was the soundtrack of the youth counter-revolution. And so all of the rock and roll icons, not just Jim Morrison, but Frank Zappa of the Mothers of Invention, all of them, they were sons and daughters of the military elite. What was their purpose? The military set these rock and rollers up to take control of the white, the young white anti-war counter-revolution. And they did it by drugging mm -hmm. the counter-revolution with LSD. Mm -hmm. So the military mm -hmm. used its sons to create rock and roll icons of the 60s and 70s for the purpose of counter-revolution and anti-war pacification. That's an example, not just of the military entertainment complex, the military giving rise to popular uh, entertainment for military purposes. Not for entertainment purposes. Right. For military purposes. Right. And why this is important, the same thing that was done, the same way the military entertainment complex is illustrated with the rock and roll of the 60s and 70s, the same military entertainment complex followed the exact same script with hip-hop. Except it was LSD with the white youth, but then it was blunt, malt liquor, and then ultimately Molly and Zand and all of the pharmaceuticals. Now, the exact same script that was played, that they played on their children, they're playing on ours, but to a much deadlier degree. So now here we are in 2018 the most popular genre of music worldwide worldwide tell us your thoughts from the God perspective now 
of the value of the hip hop community and why we need a cultural revolution and what that looks like. Yes, sir. <clears throat> hip hop is, and I think I said this in Detroit, um, hip hop is a beautiful black stallion. Yes, sir. It's a black stallion that everybody can't rock. It's a black stallion, a beautiful and powerful black stallion that, you know, it's not like the circle of scholars, for example, like I was. Right? My, my class of people, we're a horse, we can do what we do, but we're not that beautiful black stallion. We don't have the beauty or the power of that black stack. The preachers, all of the clergymen, they are powerful. As a circle, they are a, pow they're a powerful horse. They can get us somewhere, but they're not a black stack. They don't have the power that the hip hop community has. The beautiful black stallion. Now here's the situation, Brother Miles. Right now, this beautiful black stallion is saddled by our enemies. It didn't start that way, but in the late 80s and by the 90s, our enemy was firmly, firmly seated in the saddle on this black stallion and has been riding this beautiful black stallion since then in the direction that our enemy wants it to go in the direction to lead our people in the direction that our enemy wants us to go and our people because our, our, because this stallion is so black and beautiful all of our people are fixated the whole world in fact is fixated on this stallion that's what distinguishes the black stallion from any other horse there are other horses around the stallion the scholars, the preachers, everybody right? even, uh, even athletes <laughs> the athletes are shiny, but the athletes, not even that beautiful black stallion. So it commands the attention of the whole world. And so where this black stallion is going, the, the world is following. But where the black stallion is going, it's going at the direction of the enemy that saddled on it. God wants to ride this beautiful black stallion. But in order for God to ride this beautiful black stallion and by God commandeering the stallion, he will use the stallion to get not just black people in America, but he will use the stallion to get the world where he wants the world to be. He made the stallion that powerful. Only God can make the God. And if the rappers are the gods of the black community, it's only because God made them that. And of course, why would God make gods out of musicians? Because God himself is a musician. He mm. created the world with music. He's the first musician. So God recognized God. He made the musicians God. So if he wants to follow on this black stallion. But in order for that to happen, the hip hop community has to kick the enemy off. And that's the responsibility, that's the revolution that's necessary. That's the cultural revolution that's necessary. Our hip hop artists have to take that control of the art, of the culture. We are not in control of the culture. Our enemy is absolutely in control of the culture. And because we want the money, the fame, the women, the life that's promised to us. We capitulate and comply with what the enemy has made of the culture. So the black stallion is not bucking the enemy. That's the problem. Wherever the pale rider of this black stallion directs the stallion to, 
it goes and doesn't bust. That's the problem. That's why the hip-hop community must atone with the rest of us. Because they're not even bucket. They are complying with the direction that our enemy wants this culture, this beautiful animal to go. The revolution that's necessary is our artists must take control of the art again. Have to take control. It's going to cost. It's going to cost. Mm-hmm. You're not going to get the, the, the record deals that you want. You're not going to be blinging as quickly as you want. It's going to cost to kick the enemy out of the saddle. But we've got to be willing to pay that cost. That's the cultural revolution, in my opinion. Beautiful. Beautiful. I want to bring Half Pine in and, of course, my big brother, James Bond from Public Enemy, because I know they have some questions and or some commentary yes, uh, based on all that we've heard tonight. So let's start with Half Pine. Half Pine, you with us? Yes, I am, brother. And I want to thank you for your um, your piece and your segment. And, and I thank you for coming on and, and joining and, and sharing your information. I just have one question. And that happens to be, um, what do you see the woman's role in hip hop through all of this manifestation and control of others? In our, in our, in our culture. It is critical. In fact, it is defining. You know, it's just a half pint. I, I would like to answer that and illustrate it like, like this. I think it's a perfect illustration of the power of hip hop and where we need to go. Uh, many people may make hay out of the fact that in the Holy Quran, the religious book of, or the sacred text of the Muslims, the Quran describes paradise in a very peculiar way. It describes paradise as a place where there's 70 virgins, right? Um, and people make hay of that they, because they don't understand it. What they don't understand is the particular point that Allah is making in that verse is in the world where slut walks are dignified. In a world where the slut is literally dignified. In a world where the virtuous woman is scorned and mocked and little girls don't grow up desiring anymore to be a virtuous woman our little girls grow up desiring to be Nicki Minaj. And I listen to Nicki Minaj. I enjoy her music, but it is what it is. In that world, if you come upon a community and it has 70 virgins in it, meaning a community of virtuous women, know that you have entered paradise. Because in this world, the virtuous woman is, this world is inimical to virtue in a woman, in a woman. And so hip hop has been a, let me say, weaponized hip hop. Weaponized hip hop, not organic hip hop. Weaponized hip hop has been critical in promoting the privileged slut. Hip hop has been critical in making our girls look down on virtue and up on hold them, if I can say. The same way hip hop has done that, hip hop, and in particular, the women of hip hop, and the men of hip hop, and how we present women because there's no such thing as a no good woman the most honorable Elijah Muhammad teaches us because every no good woman was made no good by no good man so the men of hip hop and the women of hip hop they can make virtue and femininity popular again in fact you that area of paradise that the Quran describes that area where you can walk in and it's a community of 
virtuous women signified by all of these virgins, all of these women who didn't just give themselves away, but waited to give themselves to their husband? Hip hop can more effectively contribute to the process of building that paradise than any other force. Preachers, all the preachers together could not create that community as quickly and as effectively as hip hop can. But women have to be the first to demand that level, not just respect, but representation. Hip hop presents women in one way. Women have to demand to be presented in a very different way. I hope that makes sense. Beautiful. Yes, it does. I appreciate it. Beautiful. Thank, thank you, Half Pine, for that question. Brother James, we're going to move question. over to James Baum, founding member of the legendary public enemy I, i'm sure brother james uh, has major influence in, in my life and absolutely absolutely and, I, and i'm sure just based off what you said so much public enemy lived and really were it not absolutely. for this group so many of us would not have heard the honorable minister louis farrakhan's voice we would not that's have right. heard in his name. name that's exactly i got right. my hand raised that's right. That's right. So, Brother Follow James, far time. That, that, that's that was right. When I first heard that name. That's right. And that's look right. where we are today. Yes, sir. So I'm right there with you. My hat is off to you, Brother James Bond. Yes, sir. Thank you. All praises due to Allah. Um, you said so much. Um, I was trying to like just like take it all in. I think. A lot of times what happens with us is when you're young, you really don't understand what's happening. But all you know is this. At that time, I think I was maybe 22 or 23 years old. I had just came into the nation of Islam. I registered 1985, October 5th, 1985. And my first actual event in the nation of Islam was at Madison Square Garden, 1985. That. Right, that's right. Uh, October 7th on the Messenger's uh, birth anniversary. Yes, sir. And two years after I accepted the nation of Islam, I went on a world tour. I was traveling the entire world as a member of Public Enemy. Now, at that time, I don't think anybody knew that there were members of the Nation of Islam a part of Public Enemy at that time. They didn't know that at that time, but maybe a year or two in after it like really blew up. I don't think none of us understood at that time what was happening with us until we got in trouble with the Jewish community in 1989. Mm -hmm. That was mm -hmm. uh, in D.C., Washington, D.C., around April, May. Professor Griff's comments. Pro progressive, uh, Professor Griff's comment. Now, I'm, I was the one who gave Professor Griff um, this. I had the first copy of the secret relationship between blacks uh, and Jews by the... Uh, mm -hmm our historical department it was a rough mm -hmm. draft in, at that time oh, and wow. brother had gave it had gave it to me i also had a book um the international jew by henry ford henry ford and right and i gave that book to griff and and, and griff was talking about it and, and and we was going through some individually as a group at that time chuck didn't do he didn't do the interviews. At this time, he just told Griff to do it. And, you know, Griff uh, said what he said. And what he said wasn't a lie. It was the truth. But, wow. you know, as the Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan teaches us that truth out of season is not wow. always a good thing. Right. Wow. Um, and we went on a whirlwind from that point on uh, from what we started at the say. Uh, at that time because our whole initial thing was to be in there two years 
and raise 5,000 liters. That was our total goal. Now, how the S1Ws came about within this, this thing, and I'm gonna say this publicly because we never we never talk about it. Around the time that, Ant, what, what's his name? Uh, the, the young brother, 1985, he, was, he escaped the police at that, Larry Davis. Mm-hmm. And right, right, right. El- Eleanor Bumpers was shot down. 62 year old black woman was shot down by a police officer trained. You know, he, she said she had a butcher knife and she came out and he, he, the officer shot her down. Well, myself, brother Roger, brother Mike, brother James, and professor Griff, we all was talking about, you know, this can't continue to happen where police shoot us down and no consequences, no nothing, um, take place in these people well i think god had shaped our mindset so at that time that our whole thinking was you know we got to get back at these people we really got to do something about this and that took that that took shape in the form of the s1ws and the music of public enemy and like around Mm -hmm. 80 80, 89, 90, when we was invited out to the palace and the minister talked with us and told us, uh, you know, some things. It was that man who helped some young men who didn't understand the, the entire thing that was at us at that time. Oh, because... I don't think any of us understood it and, you know, being threatened and your life and right. Marty, uh, right. this, this Jewish guy named Mordecai Levy with a, right. a, an assault rifle down the street from uh, Def Jam or, or Rush Management, you know, it, 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 was, it was critical. I don't think any of us understood that because we were so young. We wasn't thinking about it. I mean, we were still. It, it was either Rick Rubin or Jimmy O'Brien describing that incident said that a truckload of JDL with rifles pulled up, uh, reached out to him looking for you guys. Well, see, a now truckload that. of Jewish <laughs> officially Jews with rifles contacted him looking for you guys. Wow. Now see that I didn't I didn't know that. And yeah, Minister Farrakhan at that time. Or Rick Rubin said that. <laughs> wow. Now check yeah. that out. Now at that time the minister put the whole nation of Islam behind when he found out that there were several members of the nation of Islam were part of public enemy. And our influence was on the entire group. Um Professor Griff, um, myself, Brother James, and Brother John, all uh, members of the Nation of Islam, and Brother Roger was a five percenter at that uh, at those times, and very um, he was an ally of the Nation of Islam. And what what took place from that time to now? Well. You know, uh, the Russell Simmons, the, the Leo Cohen, and most of the people didn't know that Leo Cohen, after Rick Rubin left, Leo Cohen was just the road manager for Run, Run DMC. But then he ended up becoming in very powerful positions in, in Rush Management, right. which he was the president of Rush Management, the Russell, uh, Russell Simmons uh, company. But then right. he became the president of Def Jam. Now all of this. Right, happened. I think it was him who said. I'm sorry, it was Leo Cohen who reported that in the interview. Not Jimmy O'Brien. It was Leo Cohen. Yeah, yeah. Leo Cohen. Le- 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 now, see, that now he never. Cohen. Wow. See, he never said anything to none of us about that. But I had heard that Mordecai wow. Levy. Uh, Mordecai Levy had an assault rifle, and. That maybe was the incident where all of them came. But I say this here, Minister Farrakhan put the whole nation of Islam behind us. And wherever we went, there was either 50 or more brothers there to look out for us. And 
it that that atmosphere was so charged at that time in 1994 and I'm, and I'm bringing it on, on up he told us that didn't you know that you was in the book you know he said we was in the book um, he talked about the enemy didn't want you all free saying what you all were saying because you're changing what their plans was hmm. You're, 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 you're moving black people in a direction mm. um, from fight the power on. It, it, it was just a movement. And then wow. the, 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 the album covers just start to become like fear of a black planet. And, you wow. know, it, it, it was just charge and the minister interpreted all of that. He said to us, brothers, you all are uh, like Muhammad Ali was to the messenger, public enemy, is that for me? Blew my mind. I was like, whoa. I I, I mean, because you're young, you don't you don't understand your influence. But then in all of that, Jim Brown, the Jesse Jacksons, the Reverend Al Sharpton, all of them was coming at coming at us. And Jim Brown said to me, and I've been friends with him now over 30 years. He said, man, if it wasn't for you young niggas, he just said it just like that. Waking me up, I would have still been in my slump. But it was you guys who brought me back into this. And you all came, you know, Minister Fire. I was wondering who was you young guys who wasn't afraid of Firecon. He was like, and he said it. He mm -hmm. said it to me up at his house. Because I, I, I stayed with him for about four months And he told me that And I was blown away Like, you know, I told him he was my boyhood idol You know, from the time I was about nine years old To see his music And I just was paraphrasing some of the things That we went through And uh, Going into Los Angeles And the Bloods and Crips Letting us come through Nicholson Gardens And, and Q Gardens and, you know, flavor with the crazy colors on, nobody harmed us. Um, nobody, it, it, it was us being able to speak to all of hip hop, even if they had beefs with one another, we was able to speak to them and change their mind and their direction in, in the way it was going. So from that point on, we became like enemy, like enemy of the state or something. Yes, like. Sir. It seemed like they was coming at us on every level uh, mm -hmm. of endeavor, whatever we tried to do, whatever. You know, it, it was a two-edged sword for them because when they came at us, the record sales would go up, you know, without no record, with, without no radio play. Um, mm -hmm. They didn't make us. So it was us going into the neighborhoods, uh, going from the, when we got to the city, we went to the neighborhood, we went to the mall, and we promoted ourselves without that, without help from anybody. We just went there. And it wasn't Russell Simmons that signed Public Enemy. It was Rick Rubin because Russell didn't like us. He didn't oh, like really? Us. He didn't like our brand of music. Wow. You know, it was Rick Rubin uh, on... With, with um, Jam Master J who would bump our music in the Jeeps. And he said to Rick Rubin, he said, man, you want to hear God on the mic? And it was Chuck's voice. And from that point on, it, it was, it was fear of a black planet wow. <laughs> from that time on. But my, but my, me making a long statement, I wanted to ask you the question of, how I can we history thank you absolutely <laughs> <laughs> yes sir oh praise to tell uh how do we as a people to defend ourselves because i heard you say one time in the water we had um yes sir estrogen in the water how do we yes, defend sir. ourselves uh protect our mind and, and ourselves with all of this stuff going on with our enemy 
that that is the most important final question, ultimate question um, to a discussion like this. Uh, how, how how are we set? Uh, are, are we just sitting ducks? Nothing but victims. We can't. What can we do against this high level assassination? Um, the fact of the matter is there is something we can do. It's simple yet hard. It's simple yet hard. It's simple because it doesn't require purchasing high-tech equipment. It just requires certain lifestyle changes. It's hard because it requires lifestyle changes. So start with the water as an example. As an example. Mm. Our water is weaponized. In every city, the water is weaponized. Most, at least half of the bottled waters are weaponized. So even avoiding drinking tap water when I say weaponized I'm talking about both the um, silico fluoride the weapons grade fluoride that our water is um, fluoridated with weapons grade fluoride is what's in in the city water on top of that the lead, but on top of that, the estrogenic chemicals. So it's in our uh, bath water, it's in the tap water. So what do we do? Well, we don't have to drink tap water. We should. I followed the, the Honorable Brother Minister Farrakhan's lead and I only drink Fiji. All right, well, but I'm not taking a bath in Fiji. I'm not taking a shower in Fiji. When we take a shower, we are falling victim to the weaponized water. So what do we do? Not take showers? No, we do take showers. So then what's the answer, Brother Wesley? Well, first, limit the exposure to the weaponized water. But then we can counter that minimal exposure by changing our diet. The specific diet that God prescribed for us. Through the most honorable Elijah Muhammad. The specific diet prescribed in how to eat to live, to live, if we follow that diet, then we can counter the effects of the minimal um, exposure that our best effort will still may expose us to certain levels of this stuff. But we can counter the effect of the minimal exposure through changing our diet. But people have to be willing to change the diet. People have to be willing to eat the Navy bean, which is key to countering those effects. People got to be willing to drink the milk. Everybody want to be a Dr. Sadie vegan now. But don't drink milk. But the Honorable Lars Mama said drink milk. Well, Honorable Elijah Muhammad gave a prescription that can help us counter the effects. So we don't have to stop taking showers and walk around funky because we, we're afraid of being estrogenized by our shower water. We ain't got to do that. We can take our shower and still not suffer the consequences of it because we have already reestablished the right balance with our biochemical system with the food that the right foods that we eat so the music one our biochemistry through our diet is everything once we get through our diet we stabilize and rehabilitate is the word I'm looking for rehabilitate a biological system through our food, we can rehabilitate, re-harmonize our biochemistry, then 
with the music that we listen to. One, just as the devil has conscripted music into his plan, God has too. Every single person listening to us tonight should order the seven disc music set of the Honorable Brother Mr. Farquhar. Why do I say that? God is a musician. And this is why the prophet or the servant of God in the Bible, the one that he says is after his own heart, after God's own heart, David. He was the chief musician of the Lord. He played the music that made God the musician please. The most honorable Elijah Muhammad said of the honorable brother Mr. Farrakhan, you remind me of David. The honorable brother Mr. Farrakhan is the chief musician of the Lord. And the music, the music that we can and must avail ourselves to through his album set. It is a a divinely scientifically prepared music that will help alter, help rehabilitate our neurological and biological frequencies. The same thing that the devil is doing through music. God intends to do with music as well. And so we must avail ourselves to music that can can have a medical effect on us. That they have a thing called music therapy, literally. Music therapy. They where they use music to help in certain kinds of physical therapy. So we must avail ourselves to the right diet, avail ourselves to the right musical frequency. And the blessing is we can direct people today to the correct, some of the correct musical frequencies that will help us reestablish our frequencies. That's the music of the most honorable, the honorable brother, Mr. Farrakhan. So the, the long and short of it, brother Jack, this is a battle over our biology and our neurology. All of these attacks are aimed at producing particular effects in our neurology and then our biology and therefore producing behavioral effects. We counter that by protecting our neurology, protecting our biology, by getting our biology right and getting our neurology right. So we have to, the greatest protection is in the food. The greatest protection, Brother Jack, is in the food that we eat because it's the food that we eat that prepares our organism, both physical and neurological. This is why the one book that the Most Honorable Elijah Muhammad of the well, five books or so, the one book that says, From God, that's how to eat to live. Because it's the diet that he prescribes for us that is the key to our protection from all of these scientific assaults. The diet is everything. And therein lies the difficulty. Because that's a lifestyle change that black people are so, so resistant to. So while I said it, Simple yet difficult. All of so it's simple because all of what we describe, we can literally combat it by doing nothing bigger than change our diet in a specific way. But that's the hardest thing in the world for black people to do. That's why eighty percent, I think, the numbers are of black people are, are either obese or overweight. We are an obese, overweight people because we insist on not eating or living, consuming the diet that God himself 
has prescribed to us as the antidote of everything we've been discussing. Beautiful. Well, let me let now me you do have this. It, brother Mark. You, yes, sir. Let me let me do this, brother. Uh, or actually, first half pint. Before we wrap up, is there any other question or comment that you may have? I know we heard a lot. There's a lot to digest. Um, but I think that it would be, I would be remiss if I didn't ask Half Pine or Brother James um, before we hear any final words from Dr. Wesley um, if there was any other question or comment that you all may have. So Half Pine, I'll start first with you. Uh, no, brother, I think he said it all, and I definitely appreciate the words of wisdom and the jewels he dropped. Absolutely. Thank you. Brother James, how about yourselves? Any final question or comment that you may have before we hear final uh, parting words from Dr. Wesley? No, sir. Just keep helping our father, brother. <laughs> That's right. Well, Dr. Wesley, so we, you know, on behalf so. of, of my sister Half Pine and Brother James and, and everybody that helps um, to continue to, to push this platform, Hip Hop for Justice, forward. And as we are striving to improve our reach and influence, knowing that it's not the popular discussion, you know, there's no That's drinks right. involved. We're not we're not trying to see who's the, the, the champ at, at taking them back That's and knocking right. them down. No disrespect, yes, but we, you know, we, we have so many platforms that kind of lend to uh, yes, a lot of frivolous conversation, foolishness, and, and, and rumor, and, and madness. Absolutely. It's very um, rare to have a platform where hip-hop is being discussed, but we're talking about it, its absolute value and the great potential. Right. Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan said that the value of the hip hop community is that it has the potential to be the light that produces revolution and, and understanding that to the degree that we understand it, knowing the, the reach and the influence of, of hip hop on our lives and on the world, speaking specifically of myself and brother James, it was a no brainer for us to seek assistance from those that we personally know in the very narrow beginning of this platform to help us fight for justice for Mario Woods, not knowing that it would expand to where it is now. So now that we understand that, as Brother James and I and, and others, we, we talked early on, not tonight, but a couple of years ago, that we saw that this was much bigger than us and much bigger than how it began so we took a, a, a different approach because we understood that the responsibility was on our shoulders and we were being missioned. And so yes, this uh, platform is there's those that are behind the scenes, those that are on the call listening that aren't haven't shared anything, but they're listening. But they absolutely are wind beneath our wings. So I want to on behalf of the, the silent partners and those that you hear, mm -hmm. Half Pine, Brother James, and myself, thank you for spending so much of your Sunday evening with us. Oh, um, we thank your family for allowing you, to, you know, to, to sharing you with us tonight. Before we conclude, any final words that you may want to give those that are listening and those that will hear this in the future? Well, I just want to say I, I share your recognition of the rarity of this platform, Brother Miles, the mature, um, productive dialogue that you have in the context of, of hip-hop, um, it is rare. And so I thank you, Sister half for Brother James, for the work you are doing for our father. Um, as helpers in the cause of Islam, which cause is the rise of black people. So the work that you are doing through this platform to help in the cause of the rise of black people through this hip hop platform is very powerful. I'm very impressed and thankful um, that you exist. You're doing the work, and I'm honest that you would invite me to 
to spend some moments with you on your platform and and to um, serve on the battlefield for get, together for this short period. All praise is due to Allah. Thank you so much. And please give our love and greetings to your family. And of course, uh, when possible, please extend our love and greetings to the Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan and yes, his sir, family. Sir. So thank you, Dr. Wesley, Sister Half Pine, and Brother James. Thank you all for everything that you, thank you do to continue pushing us forward. Thank everybody who's called in, that's been listening, and I'm sure that you all, like I, have been well fed. God willing, we'll be back next week, same time, same platform, and we look forward to another beautiful discussion. Until then, may God bless you all. Peace and love, family.